Good morning, everyone. I think we I think we're going to get going. Um, welcome to the Emerging Employment Law Issues in Key African Jurisdictions webinar. That's quite a mouthful for a Friday morning. Um, my name is Helen Wilsnach. I'm a partner in the Employment and Employee Benefits Practice in South Africa. Um, and I'm very excited to be joined by so many of my um, colleagues across the African continent. But before I introduce you, I'd just like to get a few housekeeping matters out the way, which will hopefully enhance the webinar experience for everyone. Um, as participants, you are automatically muted and the chat functionality has been disabled. But if, if you've got any questions during the webinar, please just make use of the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll then collate them and we will try and see which ones we can address during the webinar or if we have time at the end, we will also look at those. We'll not be providing written answers, but we will be recording the webinar and it will be available on our website later today at www.bowmanslaw.com. Um, so with the housekeeping out the way, I would just like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone on the panel and to introduce you all to the panel. Um, we've got um, Ernest Wiltshire from our, U, from our U, Uganda office is joining us. I'm just going from our, moving around my screen. We've got um, Roz Davies from our South African office. We've got um, Mintuab Afwa, who is, comes from our close associate um, firm in Ethiopia. She's a senior associate at Aman um, Asefa. Um, John Kawana is from our Zambia office. He's a senior associate in our Zambia office. Um, Sinead Kalkatia is a partner in our Mar Mauritius office, which unsurprisingly is a very popular one for, for visits and secondments. Um, then um, we've got Jamoke Lambo from, again, from one of our best friends firms in Nigeria, Udo Odomo. And um, Jamoke is actually dialing in from the state. So it's about one o'clock in the morning her time. So a special welcome to you. Um, and Terry Mwangu is a partner in our Kenya office and Charles Marcy is um, a partner in our Tanzania office. So welcome everyone. Um, when we were putting the seminar together and we were looking at what the emerging trends were, I was expecting a huge diverse range of topics. I mean, Africa's got 54 countries, it's 20% of the world's land mass um, and I think we forget how just generally what a huge diverse place it was. But what was um, very telling about probably how COVID-19 pandemic has shaped the last three years is that across the board, um, two topics that were flagged by everyone was the question of mandatory vaccination policies for employers and just this acceleration in the way of, and changes in the way of working and the challenges and opportunities this is presenting employers with. So hybrid working, flexible working, but that we no longer look at looking at coming into a bricks and mortar office every day, Monday to Friday. So there were data privacy issues in some jurisdictions that were raised, jurisdiction specific changes in legislation, all of which I'm sure will come um, to clients in those jurisdictions will be will be dealt with. Um, but what we are going to focus on today, so it's going to have a bit of a, a COVID-19 pandemic feel to it, is we're going to be focusing on the challenges posed by vaccination policies and what does this mean for employers in the different jurisdictions with this change in the way that we're working. Um, and one of our clients who works across the continent, I think put it quite nicely. They said they view vaccinations as a policy issue that we need to be dealing with now. So an interesting one, which has raised questions about competing rights and employees, the need to keep your employers safe, but we're probably not gonna be having a conversation about vaccinations, hopefully if we have this webinar in two years time. But I think what we're all pretty clear on is we're probably going to be discussing the change in the way to work um, talent retention, the fact that people want to work across borders, and these are some of the issues that we're going to be um, touching on today. So I think I've done enough um, talking as facilitator for now, and I'm going to hand over to Charles in Tanzania, where I know that they've been there's been challenges with balancing health and safety rights and the rights of employees. So um, Charles, over to over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um... As introduced, my name is Charles. 
Marcy, I'm a corporate partner based in Inda. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll provide uh, essentially an assessment of, of the law and, and the practice in respect to uh, COVID vaccinations in Tanzania from an employer perspective, an employee perspective. Um, and just a general overview in terms of the approach in the market on the um, flexibility that, that employees have provided to employees in respect to the working environment. Um, from a, a, a COVID vaccination perspective, and to start with, um, there is essentially no legal framework that specifically addresses the COVID vaccinations in Tanzania. Um, there is no legislation that, that actually um, regulates how employees or employees should um, essentially uh, carry themselves with respect to how they approach COVID vaccinations in Tanzania. Um, but what we essentially have is general policies and guidelines from the government. Um, and on the basis of, of that, uh, employees in the market have essentially uh, been taking the approach of, 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 of ensuring that they um, encourage employees to undertake the necessary vaccinations. Um, and, 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 and this is essentially um, also um, a requirement under, 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 under the um, Occupational Health and, and Safety Act in Tanzania that an employer has essentially an obligation to ensure that they create a safe working environment for their employees. Um, but at the same time as employers, and I think what we've essentially seen, um, a lot of employers struggling with in the, here in Tanzania is, um, you know, to, to try and um, ensure that they encourage their employees to undertake the vaccination, but at the same time, you know, ensuring that they do not be perceived or they do not come out as being a bit discriminative or as trying to impose requirements which are not essentially catered for under the law. Um, and uh, again, this becomes more of a, a discussion point where um, the employers are, would essentially want to have um, a, the, you know, a discussion with the employees to ensure that uh, th th there is a clear sort of process or policy that, that, that would need to be followed within the working environment. Um, and we've been getting queries around you know, what would essentially be um, the, the most appropriate approach to follow, especially in circumstances where employees are either reluctant to um, undertake the vaccination um, and what we've um, uh, essentially seen as the practice and recommendations being provided to employees is that it's important to provide necessary education. Um, it's important to try and emphasize to employees the benefits of undertaking vaccinations. Um, there are some there are certain uh, um, circumstances where we even saw employers trying to reward employees who decide to undertake vaccination. Um, but in circumstances where employers would essentially um, want to, to, to at least try and push um, for that, we would also see, um, or we have also seen that uh, there, there, there has been certain employment policy requirements where an employer would require an employee not to come in um, until such time that they have undertaken their vaccination. Um, and to, to that particular end, and in terms of, of, of the overall practice that we, we have seen in Tanzania, there has been a considerable uptake uh, of the employees undertaking vaccination. Um, although at the moment, what, what we've seen is also some slowed down of, 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 of this particular 
process and requirements. But um, in summary, I would say that uh, um, this has always been an ongoing conversation and it's, it still is an ongoing conversation between employers and employees. And um, the steps that, 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 that I've just indicated are some of the things that, that, that we've essentially seen um, in terms of the on-ground on practical approaches that have actually been taken. Um, and there's, there's essentially not been a lot of legal sort of, I'll say, challenges with, 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 with those particular approaches. Um, but also just one of the other things that uh, we have seen, especially all that we have experienced in Tanzania, and um, which is also effectively not covered under law, um, is, is, is the, uh, the flexible working environment, um, is especially just taking into account that as a country, Tanzania did sort of take an unconventional approach to the pandemic. Um, we did not experience any lockdowns. Um, and uh, in, especially at, at the time that COVID cases were very serious, um, at, at the peak of it all, uh, business um, was being undertaken as usual in, in the country. Um, but we've seen employers or we saw employers really taking proactive steps to ensure that they safeguard their working environment. And this included allowing for a bit of flexibility where employees would work from home or, you know, try to make sure that you have few employees in so that they can uh, alternate. And even at this point in time where we've seen COVID cases slowing down, um, these practices have continued and what we, 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 what we essentially anticipate is that uh, um, these this, this practices would continue for the foreseeable future and it, 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 it would, or they would potentially become the usual practice, the norm, and, 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 and um, you know, we, I would not be surprised if, 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 if some kind of um, legal framework does come into place to, to cut and accommodate for, for, this, for this particular approach that um, em employers have decided to take. So um, in, in terms of the flexibility, um, that is what we, we, we've essentially seen. And we know that uh, at the moment, there has been a continued uh, practice by em employers to give their employees sufficient uh, flexibility, um, you know, to, to, to ensure that they can work from wherever that they are. Um, and, 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 and as I indicated, we, we, we see that um, this would uh, potentially continue for the, for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Over to you, to you Helen. Thanks, Charles. Thanks. To Terry, um, in Kenya, so it seems quite a similar approach to other countries in the region on, along vaccinations, but what I find fascinating is that your legislators seem to be thinking quite far ahead in terms of the right to work, I mean the right to dis disconnect and, and what this flexible working looks like. So um, yeah, very interested to hear from you. Sorry, <laughs> two and a half years after COVID, the mute and mute function is still a challenge. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for making the time to meet with us and have a conversation across different jurisdictions about you know, what, what the post-pandemic life is looking like for employers and employees. So you're quite right, um, Helen, in terms of the right to disconnect in Kenya. Um, I was actually quite surprised that the bill has gone as far as it did. I had expected that it would have been, you know, perhaps given um, a death knell right off the bat. I think it's quite progressive for our jurisdiction, um, just for the purposes of those on the call who may not be aware, but the Kenyan government or the Kenyan legislature is looking at introducing an amendment to the Employment Act to allow for an employee's right to disconnect. And what that would mean, therefore, is that an employer would not be allowed 
to reach out to employees outside of their normal working hours or their contractual working hours. Of course, for those of us in um, different industries, whether it's um, manufacturing or professional services, we're all aware of that catch-all phrase in our contracts, which says that we will be required from time to time, you know, to be able to meet to um, our employers' duties or deadlines or obligations. That then becomes a challenge because if the right to disconnect um, contractually then says that you're not allowed to reach to reach out to your employees past say 5 p.m. or over weekends, it then becomes a challenge in the sense of, you know, for example, in the context of a law firm or a professional service, how do you then ensure that you're able to service your clients without um, the related risk of um, facing employment um, suits against employers. So where the, the bill is at this stage, Helen, is it's still going through parliament. I think it, I believe it's at the second reading stage. So there is actually a chance that it might pass. Um, I'm still quite, um, I'm still of the view that I don't think that we are ready for it. And I am not sure that it will garner the requisite support for it to pass into law. But if it does, I think it then becomes a very important conversation for us to have as employers, because you know what we then see is it will be necessary to have a lot of changes to our contracts, our employment contracts. And by extension, it may well be whatever retainers we have with clients. So for example, if clients are expecting that if there's a team of people um, working on their matters that they're reachable at whatever time, um, you know, we know Jumake right now is in the US one in the morning. Um, if we're working with a Kenyan team that is now subject to a right to disconnect, what does it mean then for, you know, us requiring members of the team to be available outside those hours. So I think it, it would pose a very um, complex challenge to the way in which we work. I, again, I say, I don't think it will pass, but if it does, then, you know, we would have to relook at employment contracts. And just touching on, on what um, Charles had mentioned about mandatory vaccinations. I mean, I don't want to repeat what he has said, but it's a similar situation in Kenya. But I think, um, you know, what, what comes up very strongly, at least from the Kenyan perspective, and I would imagine applies the same for the Eastern African countries, taking cognizance of the fact that I know in Southern Africa, it's a bit different. You know, I think it's now important that for those of us who have not yet implemented a COVID vaccine policy, it's very important that we do so you know, there needs to be a sense of what the heat map is. So certain considerations like what does the policy say? Um, as, as Charles has pointed out, which is the position in Kenya as well, an employer cannot require that an employee takes a vaccine um, as an obligation to continue to work. Employees can be encouraged to take the vaccine, but you can't go as far as say that you have to take the vaccine. But there must be a policy. The policy must, must be very clear as to what the employment obligations would therefore be. So, for example, if the policy is that you have to have a COVID vaccination, sorry, you have to show that you have a COVID vaccination, or if you don't have a COVID vaccination, to then take a weekly PCR test, that needs to be make out, made out very clearly because, um, as Charles also rightly pointed out, as an employer, you're required to facilitate and provide a safe working environment. So the first thing there must be a COVID policy that's unequivocal, makes it quite clear that either I need to have the vaccine and if I do, then I should be able to produce the vaccine certificate. If I don't have a vaccine certificate, um, is the employer going to require that I then take a weekly PCR test at my own cost to be able to access the office? And if neither of the two, if the employer's um, policy allows for me to work remotely and whether the employer will be then um, able to facilitate remote working. Of course, we know that there are some rules that are not able to be done remotely or agile, and then that you know, becomes a very difficult con consideration. The policy shouldn't be discriminatory. So for example, if um, the reason that an employee doesn't want to take the vaccine is for religious um, reasons or for health reasons, they cannot be required to take it. And the policy can't be seen to apply to a certain cadre of staff um, against another cadre of staff. So it should not be discriminatory. And it should also not be um, such that it can be construed as giving rise to constructive dismissal. 
So again, you know, not telling employees that if you don't take the vaccine or if you don't show that you have a vaccine, then you can't come to work and we will not be able to, you know, offer you your role. There are obviously certain roles that require um, a level of, of uh, consideration in terms of travel. So if the employee is required to travel from time to time for work, then a conversation needs to be had with them about the vaccine policy and whether or not they're willing to take it and how far, therefore, an employer is able to accommodate it. The conversation may well end up being a separation discussion, but the employer has to show that every opportunity has been availed to um, facilitate a scenario where an employee can be accommodated in terms of their challenges. Um, the last point that I just wanted to talk about was in relation to um, remote working and the tax considerations. I think um, there are some of you who may have attended um, a seminar last year where I talked about this, but I think it's still something that we have to be very alive to. You know, the world has progressed very fast in terms of how we work, not just how we work, but where we work. You know, uh, Jumoke is in the US, some of us are in different jurisdictions as well. But then that triggers tax considerations for um, employees working out of Kenya. Um, I did have some situations where some clients reached out to me in relation to employees who are either stranded in Kenya for a long period of time or found themselves by personal circumstances having to work out of Kenya. And the consideration with that, especially for multinational companies or companies that don't have a presence in Kenya, is that it can trigger a permanent um, establish establishment for tax considerations and it can lead to immigration challenges as well. Um, so, you know, um, if the employment doesn't, if the company doesn't have a permanent establishment in Kenya, then that's something that needs to be considered when an employer is allowing a, a foreign national to work in Kenya. Um, and also the residency status of the employee. If they're not a residence for tax obligations, it would force them to have to then pay tax individually. And then lastly, of course, the immigration consideration. So those are just the main, the three main issues, Helen, um, that I'd wanted to point out for Kenya. Mandatory vaccination, still not allowed. Um, the right to disconnect is, um, you know, still in parliament, but there's a risk that it may pass. And of course, also the tax considerations for agile working. Thank you very much, Helen. Thanks, Terry. And it just drives home that point, this balancing of rights for employers and just how interconnected our world of work is. I hadn't thought about that, but if you're working on a big M&A transaction and one jurisdiction has got a right to disconnect, that has a knock-on effect for everyone. So very interesting. Thank you. Um, Mentor, just from an Ethiopian perspective, again, I mean, see similar approach, but there's some instances where vaccines can be mandatory and that with remote working, it can throw up some interesting questions when you've got expat employees. So I'd be very interested to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you, everyone in the panelists and also in attendance. Uh, yes, uh, probably the employment uh, law regime is one of the uh, uh, recently well-developed legal regimes in Ethiopia for uh, two uh, reasons, one being COVID-19 and the other, the uh, internal instability and uh, what that we had he here in Ethiopia. Uh, those two sort of double jeopardy uh, in incidences, in instances has caused um, different uh, legal issues with regards to workforce reduction, mandatory vaccination, work from home arrangements. Um, focusing on the uh, issue of mandatory vaccination and work from home arrangement for the purpose of this uh, webinar, um, if we had this webinar a month ago, uh, 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 the Ethiopian jurisdiction would have been in complete uh, 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 similarity with the other uh, two jurisdictions that have been discussed just now uh, by Terry and Charles. Uh, there was no uh, mandatory vaccination requirement until just uh, recently. Um, just uh, to start off with a, a bit of numbers. Uh, only 18.5% of the total population, which is close to uh, 21 million uh, people, are 
fully vaccinated in Ethiopia, that's on top of 100, over 100 uh, million uh, people uh, uh, in Ethiopia. So it's, uh, it shows that there is only a very few portion of the, uh, the society is uh, fully vaccinated and the rest is yet to be uh, vaccinated. Um, uh, the uh, uh, overarching uh, um, labor law, which is the labor proclamation, which was uh, which is fairly new, it, it was enacted in 2019, uh, does not provide any specific regulation with regards to vaccination. I mean, COVID-19 uh, it's just something that was very unprecedented. So there is nothing in this um, uh, overarching regulation that addresses the issue of vaccination. Um, it just provides general obligation for on both the employer and the employee uh, to um, uh, keep the health and safety of uh, uh, the employees and for the employees also to observe um, these health and safety measures to take precautionary measures. There are just general obligations. Um, but there is a very brand new health directive uh, that was enacted just uh, uh, on April 1st, 2022. 2022. This is not an, an employment focused uh, regulation, rather it's a public health regulation that, uh, that was enacted for the prevention and control of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this new directive uh, has relaxed a very stringent COVID precautionary measures that was imposed by a previous uh, directive uh, with the aim of reducing the economic, social and psychological stress and restrictions that was caused due to COVID-19. Uh, so it has relaxed some of the stringent precautionary measures that were imposed um, on service providers or businesses. Uh, however, it still maintains uh, uh, the requirement to wear face masks, the requirement to provide uh, adequate ventilation at workplaces, the requirement to provide uh, personal hygiene materials at workplaces. So it has maintained some of the obligations that were imposed, particularly on uh, uh, businesses and employers. Uh, what's interesting, however, is that uh, this directive, this new directive, provides two instances where it makes um, vaccination mandatory and it also puts the requirement or the obligation on the employer to ensure that a uh, certain portion of employees are uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, the first instance is uh, on employees uh, who are frontline service providers um, who are vulnerable to COVID-19 transmission due to the nature of their work. Uh, it provides examples such as uh, employees at health facilities, banks, hotels, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, transportation providers. Uh, employers in such instances are required to ensure and also facilitate uh, full vaccination to such employees which are exposed to um, COVID-19 due to the nature of their work. Um, the other instance is uh, employees of um, that work in a congregate settings. And these, um, this directive defines congregate to mean um, uh, areas which are prone to COVID-19 due to um, the living arrangements, high-risk uh, living arrangements such as uh, prison facilities, um, internally displaced uh, uh, sites, refugee camps, uh, elderly homes. Uh, in uh, such areas which are prone to COVID-19 due to the nature of their work, again, it requires employees to ensure that their staffs are fully vaccinated. Full uh, vaccination is defined to be the uh, two uh, weeks period after uh, which uh, the appropriate dose uh, of each vaccine is taken. Um, so in these two uh, circumstances, there is a requirement for mandatory vaccination. Now what uh, these uh, uh, public health uh, directive fails to do is to um, determine what happens if uh, an employee refuses to take a, a vaccine. As this being a, a, a public health directive, it does not address it. So it takes us back to the, um, again, to the legal uh, proclamation, to the overarching legal framework, which uh, provides a failure by an employee to uh, um, observe safety and uh, health regulations, to observe um, precautionary measures, uh, as a ground for termination. So if we interpret these two laws uh, together uh, for uh, frontline service providers and for em em employees that work in a congregate setting institutions, if they refuse to take the vaccine, um, the employer may be in a position uh, to terminate their employment agreement for failure to observe these health and safety measures. Now, this is a very new law and we have not seen uh, it being implemented um, before courts. We have not seen clients coming 
to us asking um, uh, because problems are arise because employees have refused. On the ground, it has been uh, very smooth. Uh, I remember having uh, this webinar last year and discussing that uh, vaccinations were not wi widely available yet for employees, employers to force their employees uh, to take vaccination. But afterwards, there was a wide availability of vaccines across the country um, and a, a sort of resistance coming from the community due to uh, religion uh, and faith-based uh, reasons, cultural uh, reasons, and um, you know, some not being not being um, fully convinced of uh, you know the scientific findings of you know the height uh, of the vaccine. We have different we have seen different reasons raised by employees refusing to take vaccination, but um, most employees had not made it uh, mandatory yet. Um, uh, a sort of different arrangements have been uh, uh, agreed internally uh, for employees that are not willing to take the vaccines, uh, uh, you know, a continuous uh, a PCR tests are uh, provided as alternatives. We have not seen cases coming to court uh, because employees have refused to take vaccination and uh, employers have taken action on the basis of that. Um, at least no public cases before the uh, cassation court, uh, which has the, uh, the which is the only court that can pass presidential uh, value cases in Egypt. Yeah, so we have not seen that. So so far on the ground, uh, we have not seen any issues with regard to you know people refusing to take vaccines. Some institutions in the, avi in the aviation sector have made it uh, mandatory or. Um, like crew members, for example, to take vaccination. And there we have not seen employees resisting that obligation. So on the ground, there is not a lot of challenge uh, coming. And we always advise clients to strike a balance between uh, public health consideration for the overall uh, employees and uh, uh, work environment, and also uh, to keep a balance between the faith and cultural outlooks uh, on the vaccine. Uh, but it's very interesting to see how this new law is going to be interpreted by courts and also by employees. Um, quickly moving on to the issue of work from home. Um, in Ethiopia, it's been a, a, a bit unique because we've never had a complete lockdown of closures, even at a time when uh, Corona was, um, uh, uh, you know, two years back when everybody, uh, different jurisdictions had complete closures and uh, lockdowns. Ethiopia was. Um, a bit flexible in that regard. So not a lot of regulations are in place for a work from home arrangement. Um, so it's subject to an agreement between the employer and the employees. Many international organizations and companies uh, have a work from home arrangement still now, um, and we foresee that that will continue. Uh, however, there is an interesting aspect to this uh, work from home arrangement, uh, at least for some of our multinational companies. In Ethiopia, for expat employees, for um, foreign employees in Ethiopia, uh, there is a requirement for uh, a knowledge transfer and on the job training uh, as a condition for their employment. And now, uh, when most expat uh, employees um, repatriate back to their uh, home country or different restriction due to COVID-19 uh, restrictions and uh, due to the instability that we had in the country, um, there was a sort of a legal gap on what to do with this requirement for on-the-job training. Some of uh, these employees are factory workers uh, which cannot claim to have been working from their home uh, once they've repatriated back to uh, their countries. And that uh, really put their immigration status and their work permits, residence IDs into um, uh, a bit of a tricky area. Uh, again, this requires a legislation uh, remedy and um, sort of, you know, uh, the way forward is yet to be uh, seen how the government sees and uh, takes action on this matter. But uh, this is one of the interesting things that we've seen. In addition, um, again, as Terry has mentioned, the issue of taxation. Uh, with countries where Ethiopia does not have a double taxation arrangement, some of the expat employees are required to pay uh, employment income taxes both in Ethiopia and uh, in their home jurisdiction. So these are uh, new emerging issues in the Ethiopian jurisdiction with regards to work. From home, and I would be very much interested to hear from the other jurisdiction in this regard, and you know some taken lessons to be taken, you know, in terms of even advising clients would be really interesting to hear. Thank you, Helen. Back to you.
Thanks, Mr. Rob. And I suppose also, again, highlights that law is often so reactive. Hey? Things move along and then the law takes longer, longer to catch up. Um, Ernest, moving to you in Uganda, I saw somewhere the other day that your vaccination status is about 20% of the population. And also just very interested to see, given how closely aligned you often are, well, geographically with, with Kenya and Tanzania, about how the remote, the, what the remote working conversation is looking like. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, and uh, good morning to all of those people who are joining us uh, for this seminar. Um, I think for the case of Uganda, um, let me start by saying this. We had this distinct uh, medal being the longest, the, the longest uh, or having the longest lockdown period. I think we had about two years of continuous lockdown. So up to about January this year, we were still uh, under lockdown. Um, and, you know, we all know what the impact of that is you know, in terms of job security, incomes and so on. So coming out of that, um, you know, we, we were kind of playing a catch up game in many respects. But what had changed was I think the government realized the need to reopen and kind of normalize life as was happening in other places. Uh, as meant to have said, the vaccines became a bit more available um, and therefore you know, the balancing of, of interests and obligations on health and safety were perhaps easier um, to achieve. The infection rates were much, much lower than elsewhere. And I think we had more knowledge now about uh, better management of that particular problem. So we opened up and as a consequence of that opening up, you know, workplaces got back people uh, into the spaces that uh, they had pre-COVID set up for them to work in. And that has brought out all these, you know, emerging issues. They're not dissimilar to uh, what others are facing. Um, and the question really is, you know, in the context of trying to normalize these relations, you know, how do you manage um, that life in the face of a continuing pandemic? Perhaps on a positive note, um, the more difficult variant sort of disappeared and we got the more tolerable uh, variant, um, you know, across this part of the world, um, which in a sense, I think, made people feel perhaps more comfortable coming back, um, you know, to the workplace. Um, in terms of legislation, uh, again, like uh, the other jurisdictions, we don't have um, a law that says you must take the, the, the vaccine. We've got a, a Vaccines Act from 2017, which empowers the Minister of Health to issue a statutory instrument to say this vaccine is compulsory. Uh, thankfully, during this period, the minister did not take that extraordinary step of uh, issuing an, an instrument to say this is uh, mandatory. So what has happened is it's really remained an issue for the employer and policy. So again, very much like Tanzania, like Kenya, um, it's a policy issue now. And uh, the kinds of inquiries we've had relate to you know, what can go into that policy. Uh, I think Terry spoke very clearly about, you know, what, you know, should and shouldn't be in a policy of that nature. So things have remained at that level. Um, I would say that uh, what we see across uh, this jurisdiction is that employers you know, have taken a soft persuasion, let me call it that, or soft persuasion uh, um, effort uh, or direction in, in, in ensuring that uh, vaccinations are taken and that this is safe again. We haven't had challenges uh, in courts. We haven't had uh, re, um, people being dismissed because uh, they've refused to take these vaccines, or if they have, they haven't uh, brought challenges to these. So we're still watching uh, that space. But of course, the hybrid working environment, again, like everybody else has had to deal with, you know, as a consequence of this lockdown. And I think currently, you know, we still have to think carefully about the levels of productivity, the issues around satisfaction, job satisfaction, their progression, and just, you know, things that affect um, our ability to deliver in the way that we did um, pre-COVID. What I think is very clear is that a lot of the thinking has changed. 
Uh, but also it appears to me that although the hybrid working environment sort of caught on, I think for our jurisdiction, we've kind of gone back to the pre-COVID-19 arrangements, perhaps as a more preferred uh, way of, of working. I dare say that uh, what is clear to me is that I think the craving in human beings for you know physical interaction um, trumps a lot of these things. And there's still, um, I think, a general view that it's better to have a physical interaction. Now that obviously brings to the fore that very serious question of uh, health and safety, and then the mandatory vaccination. So the government um, last year published a bill, a public health amendment bill. It's currently sitting before parliament. There's a committee that's scrutinizing it. And that bill um, has, you know, proposes many amendments. And one of the ones that I think is important for us is it does suggest that there will be or there could be a mandatory vaccination. And if one doesn't willingly submit to that, if that law is passed, um, that's an offense. Uh, there's a small fine of about a thousand dollars or so, but then the equivalent is the possibility of imprisonment for up to six months. It's a bit of a disparity. It doesn't contain any uh, grounds for one um, saying, I don't want to be part of, of this mandatory vaccination. So we're watching that space. If it is passed into law, uh, I think it will give, um, well, one, if it's passed into law, but two, if it's implemented, I think it would give employers uh, a place to 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 stand on and you know require um, this mandatory vaccination. Currently, on at a policy level, what uh, people have been encouraged to do is to take the vaccine by being offered uh, appropriate information about the safety uh, concerns and so on. And um, in terms of overall vaccination, I think uh, of the country, I think we stand at about 30, maybe 35 percent. Um, but the uptake has slowed down. So as the variant um, has become weaker, uh, or at least the variant that we are currently aware of has become weaker. Uh, here, I think people have sort of um, adjusted to you know, handling it in whichever way they've been handling it. And that is also permeating into the workplace a little bit. At a policy level, these requirements we see from many uh, employers in bringing a COVID vaccination certificate or have a negative PCR test and so on. But I think that if the, you know, the issue we're dealing with remains as it is or even reduces in terms of its severity, I think the issue will at some point actually die down. Because if this, particular pandemic we're dealing with evolves as viruses we are told tend to to do and becomes less uh, of a problem and becomes a more like a common flu um, then um, that problem will perhaps quickly uh, go away so that's the situation for Uganda um, uh, back to you Helen Thanks, Ernest. Yeah, I think we're all hoping that we get to a flu, flu status, um, opposed to where we currently are. And also, interesting, in South Africa, employees are battling to get people back in the office. Um, so it's good, uh, good to hear that there are jurisdictions where that connection piece is, is important and accepted by employees. Um, Jamoke, you have been, you've been very patient. I'm really interested to hear from Nigeria obviously most um, populous country on the continent. And I know this still burns for South Africans, but I think still has got the biggest GDP in, in Africa. So yes, we'd love to hear what, what's happening in the space and vaccinations and, and the remote working piece. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. And thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Nigeria is pretty much going through the phases that everyone else has spoken about so far. Um, maybe not at a, as advanced as others. I mean, we're seeing the numbers of COVID cases go down. And as that is happening, the government is starting to relax the COVID measures in place. So as at um, April, the government had come out to say there is no longer a requirement for 
um, a limit to be put on numbers in social gatherings. Um, there is no longer a requirement, a mandatory requirement to, to wear face masks, especially in outdoor meetings, but they recommend and encourage that that continues to happen uh, in indoor meetings. Um, cynics have said maybe the government is doing this at this time because we have elections and rallies coming up. But I believe that the truth is that governments, countries must open up again. Um, we've been literally on lockdown, whether physically or not, for the last two years. And, and so everything is starting to open up and there has to be a semblance of normalcy again um, uh, across countries. And, and, and we're seeing this impact the workplace as well. Um, we started off initially with a complete lockdown because we were forced to. Then we moved into working in teams certain days a week. And then now we are working the full firm three days a week and two days off. Um, this was something that was unheard of, unthinkable. We actually thought when the younger ones would suggest it, we thought sacrilege, this can never happen. But COVID-19 happened and, and it, it was worse than us. And we have taken a decision now, COVID-19 or not, whether it goes away or not, that the way we will work in going forward will be three days a week in the office and two days um, remotely. And so that's uh, are going to be our way of life. And we're seeing that happen in a lot of um, businesses as well as they open up. They've realized that there is some benefit to that flexibility being given to employees um, to be able to take some time to work from home. Um, and so we believe that this will be the trend uh, going forward. Uh, this, this brings with it its own um, challenges, which some of which have been raised here, which is, that look, what do we do with employees who are refusing to be vaccinated for different reasons? So for instance, for health reasons, for instance, religious reasons, for instance, they, they don't believe as Minto have said in the science uh, on the ground so far. So they are not being encouraged to uh, take the vaccine. We can't compel them because there is no law that, that allows us to do so. Um, so what we're finding is people are literally navigating this uh, uncharted terrain in a way that best works for, for their workforce. Uh, the federal government sort of created a kind of platform that people are, are piggybacking off when last year the federal government came out and said all government, federal government workers um, must provide uh, proof of their vaccination status or a negative PCR test to be able to access the workplace. So this became what a lot of employers started to do as well. Um, the, of course, the federal government did it in its capacity as an employer of labor, as opposed to a federal government directive for the nation, um, leaving everyone to still determine what works for them and what doesn't work for them. But we found that a lot of employers are taking the view that they have an obligation um, an overarching obligation to provide a safe work environment for their employees. And if what that requires is to ask people what their vaccination status is voluntarily, um, or to ask them to provide a negative PCR test, then that's what they're going to do. So uh, employers are starting to put in place policies that are, are around this, but they can't compel um, employees. There's no law that, that supports that. So the question is, what do they do? What do you do in a situation where, for instance, in our situation where 98% of the workforce are vaccinated and 2% and are not? Um, so what do you do? You, you encourage uh, people to take the vaccine. You encourage people about the science uh, um, and the merits of the vaccination and you try to encourage them. And we see it working. When we started, we were at about 48% and now we're at 19, 98%. Um, so people are being encouraged to voluntarily go and take the vaccination because it's, it's just essential um, for that to happen. So the question then becomes, if you are even going to insist on negative PCR tests being provided, who is going to bear that cost? Um, you know, employers have a challenge there. And those are questions that we're starting to see. Who bears that cost, especially in situations where there are no underlying health conditions and the vaccine is readily available? 
Should that be a cost that's borne by the employee or should that be a cost that is borne by the employer? So those are things that I know we are going to see going forward. There's no directive on, on those kind of issues at the moment. Uh, and so we, we know that the courts will start to address this kind of issues now that the workplace is opening up. But so far what is happening is that where um, an employee refuses to provide um, their vaccination status or the, the, the PCR test, or even a rapid test, whatever the test is that the employer is insisting on, um, you're, they're being asked to work from home. But as Terry rightly pointed out, what happens in a situation where you need to be in the workplace? What happens to factory workers and people whose work requires them to actually be in the workplace? What do you do? Um, of course, the, the options that are, are open that we see is um, conversations around encouraging them to take the vaccination or uh, finding a different position in, the, um, uh, in your workforce that they can fit into that can allow them to work remotely or start to have those difficult conversations around separation and, and what that will mean. And I know that we will probably see a lot of cases in the courts on unfair dismissal uh, on those issues. But until that time, we, we will have to be just guided by what is practical uh, for employers to do in their different spheres of work, because it differs depending on what sector you're in, as Terry pointed out earlier as well. Um, so that's really the issue around vaccination. And, and then we, we move into that interesting topic of, of remote working that is becoming um, cr critical now, literally. Um, everyone is, is talking about it. It's become normal parlance now for us to talk about hybrid working and, and, and remote working. And so we are now encouraging employers to make sure that if this is going to be your reality, then you need to have a policy in place that governs that how that will work because there are many issues here. Um, employers have data protection obligations. Um, employees working from home expose the employer um, because of the nature of the data they are going to be working, uh, um, have access to working at home. So these are the kind of things that that kind of the policy should take care of and talk about what happens in the event of a data breach and how you escalate that. And, and just basically what is your work environment like and, and what are the things you have in place? In fact, some policies we see here are asking for physical or virtual um, investigations of the workspace that you have in your home just to make sure it's adequate for the business's purposes. So those are the kind of things that I know we will continue to see. As to law, maybe like the other jurisdictions, our legislature, legislature will come up with a law um, around this. But I believe that everyone is taking the backseat on this because of the constitutional implications um, where you try to enforce this kind of provisions and, and the, you're talking about fundamental human rights. So basically that's the situation in Nigeria where it's a moving target, we're watching it, we're advising employers based on their specific requirements, which differ. Um, but one thing that's clear is that we are no longer going to be, it's no longer going to be business as usual in the workplace. And we will have to start to look at issues around Employee Compensation Act and all the um, injuries at work and all of what that means. We're going to be looking at employees working remotely in another jurisdiction as opposed to working from home, uh, which are two different things and the implications that that will bring to the table. So the interesting time for employment law uh, lawyers um, and, and we are watching this space and we we're sure that when we come back this time next year, it'll be a different conversation yet again. Thank you. Back to you, Helen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, just, just for the insight. And it's to see how encouragement gets vaccinations up. That, that, that's great to see as opposed to um, stick approach. But moving across to John and Zambia, I mean, my understanding is there that there's been massive reluctance on the issue of vaccinations um, generally in the company, um, in the country. So it'd be just interesting to hear from you how that flows through to the work um, workforce and just any other insights you have in terms of remote working. It seems like it's in most jurisdictions um, other than Kenya, it's certainly not something that's being driven by the legislature, it's being driven by employers. Yeah, so John would be very interesting to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Helen, and thanks everyone for 
uh, joining us on this call this morning. Um, um, I, I think um, from what I'm hearing uh, from my colleagues in uh, East Africa, the situation in Zambia is not very dissimilar uh, to what is prevailing there. Um, and, and like you say, Helen, I think the, the you know, the, the, perhaps the, the best place to start from is to say that the vaccines generally have not been very well um, accepted in Zambia. Um, we have just slightly over 10% of the population vaccinated. Um, and of that number, we have uh, under 5% uh, that have received the booster vaccination. So generally as a population, there's been uh, a lot of hesitance uh, to accept the vaccines. I mean, reasons have been uh, uh, various. Uh, others have advanced constitutional reasons um, uh, that Jumoke has talked about. Um, others are just uh, suspicious uh, of the vaccine. So because of the general attitude of the population, it's been um, uh, you know, slightly difficult and also coupled with the fact that um, we had a general election uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, there's been obviously uh, very little traction uh, uh, from uh, you know, politicians um, uh, to try and um, uh, make tough decisions, uh, which might not sit well with the uh, you know, doubting population. Um, uh, you know, that notwithstanding, there's been a very a huge campaign, a massive campaign by the government to try and get um, uh, citizens vaccinated. Um, but what has come out also uh, from the government very clearly is that vaccinations are voluntary. So that has, you know, had the effect of diluting this message uh, that the government has been trying to put across uh, in the campaign uh, to get people to, uh, uh, to be vaccinated. So uh, the situation in Zambia in terms of legislation is uh, uh, quite the same as uh, what my colleagues have said. In East Africa, we do not have any legislation um, uh, that provides for uh, vaccination. In fact, the current uh, framework, the legal framework, uh, supports uh, uh, the view or, uh, that it's, it, 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 it's, it's voluntary. Uh, you cannot force uh, uh, people to get vaccinated. But what the government has done, however, is they have promulgated uh, a statutory instrument uh, aimed at uh, you know, mitigating uh, the financial distress, obviously, that is um, um, that was experienced uh, during the COVID, at least at the peak of the COVID pandemic, uh, because obviously people were not uh, operating um, uh, as usual, and we had certain sectors uh, of the economy that were completely shut down. Uh, the government had, uh, for instance, locked uh, uh, down on uh, gyms, uh, restaurants, and bars. So we had people in those uh, in those industries, uh, you know, not able to uh, to make their usual revenues. So what the government did is it uh, came up with this SI, which suspended certain obligations under the Employment Court uh, Act, uh, such as gratuity, uh, leave pay, um, uh, as well as overtime. So. Um, uh, the reaction was mostly uh, from the government to try and reduce uh, uh, expenses uh, on the part of uh, employers. Um, on the interesting subject of uh, remote working, um, the government again has taken uh, the lead and the private sectors you know, sort of followed uh, the tone set by the government. So what the civil service has done is there were several circulars that were issued um, uh, where the civil servants uh, were required to work in um, uh, weekly shifts. So you would have a certain number of people working uh, in a week and then they are off the following week. And the government has been very, um, um, has been very strong um, on, on advising uh, employers to try and keep uh, their employees away from work as much as, 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 uh, as they can. So as part of that campaign, um, it, the private sector has, has, has just followed suit and um, it's mainly been left to the discretion of the employer to try and make these arrangements where um, 
employees do not have to come into the office physically. Um, and generally from what we've seen, uh, uh, employees have, have, you know, to the extent that their operations uh, allow, employees have not insisted on, uh, employers rather have not insisted on employees uh, having to come uh, physically into the office. And we have, um, especially multinationals, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, employers who actually have uh, come up with policies, deliberate policies for employees to be working uh, from home and only come to the office when uh, it is necessary. Um, obviously, there's been a few uh, challenges. Uh, the first, obviously, is the lack of uh, a legal framework has left uh, many employers uh, guessing, you know, on, 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 on a number of things, uh, on what to do, um, for instance, with employees who uh, refuse uh, to get vaccinated. So we've had, the most queries we've had have come from multinationals, uh, obviously, who have to deal with uh, group standards and group policies. Uh, where there are requirements, uh, for instance, that employees be uh, vaccinated before they come into the workplace. Uh, the lack of a legal framework uh, then creates a problem uh, for such employers because uh, they don't know uh, what to do, uh, considering the fact that the position taken by the government is that these uh, vaccines uh, you know, are not mandatory. It's been uh, uh, slightly uh, difficult uh, to navigate through the, you know, the current uh, legal framework um, um, to find, uh, you know, some justification for the insistence that employees must be uh, vaccinated. Um, another problem, obviously a challenge, is that the exemption uh, or rather the intervention by the government to exempt certain um, provisions of the Act uh, was not very meaningful. Uh, you know, to employees who have exhaustive contracts of employment, because whereas the, 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 the exemption, the statutory instrument exempted specific provisions of the employment code, employers were still bound, uh, for instance, to pay the gratuities, the overtime, if their contracts of employment with their employees were exhaustive and provided for those things. So um, in effect, the, the, you know, the exemption or the intervention by government uh, only uh, really gave relief to a very limited number uh, of employers uh, in Zambia. So uh, generally, the only difficulties that we have had uh, uh, with regards to multinationals, obviously, who have, uh, you know, an international standard, um, which is quite different from uh, what was prevailing uh, in Zambia. I think what is also interesting uh, throughout this period, what has come out interesting is that uh, there's been a lot of accommodation uh, on the part of all the stakeholders, um, uh, that is the government employees, as well as the employers. Uh, the employment space is a very litigious uh, space in Zambia. We have uh, so many cases there. Uh, but quite surprisingly, we have not had as many uh, cases, in fact, very few cases uh, arising from uh, this COVID situation. So you get the feel that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, all the stakeholders, you know, understand that we are in a very uh, uh, difficult situation, unprecedented. And, uh, you know, many people have, you know, sort of held back on their right, um, at least in so far as uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation is, uh, is concerned. Uh, I think generally that's, that's the position in Zambia, Helen, uh, over to you. Thanks, John. And it's very interesting to hear what you say around the litigation space, because I think the experience in South Africa has been a slightly different one with people um, a lot more emotive around the issue of vaccinations, which I'm going to move to Roz now. We've had lots of employees bring in access policies around vaccinations and, and, and there's been dismissals around that, which Roz, you'll see there's a, we've got a question in the chat if, if you could look at it when you look at the vaccinations. Um, and then perhaps less, the remote working thing in South Africa, which Roz will take us through is 
we're never going back to normal. We've seen that most businesses are, are trying some type of hybrid form where they can. Um, just anecdotally, that I thought was quite interesting. One of our firm's largest clients that operates all over Africa has spent hours and hours on strategy around hybrid working and flexible working, and has had massive pushback on its vaccination policies. Was quite nervous when it rolled out its hybrid working and was somewhat relieved, but very underwhelmed when the question that was the, the question that got asked the most by employees is what must we wear when we come back to work? So um, it is quite interesting around that psychology piece about what people are concerned about. Thanks, Roz. Over to you for South Africa. Thanks so much, Helen. Hi, everyone. Um, all right. So mandatory vaccination in South Africa. Uh, the legal framework is that our um, the government specifically did not introduce mandatory vaccination. Um, and what they have um, been doing is trying to encourage vaccination. So there has been a lot of talk about vaccination. There's a lot of, um, you know, press releases about the, the benefits of vaccination, the importance of vaccination. So it's very much been aimed at encouraging employees to, to get vaccinated. Um, the difficulty is, I think that there is a lot of pushback. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we're sitting at about a 44% of the adult population that has been vaccinated. So the majority of adult South Africans have still not been, been vaccinated. And I think what the, the government has been trying to do is encourage employers to address this um, at, at the level of the workplace. So one of the, the issues that have been, you know, keeping clients in South Africa up at night is, do we implement a mandatory vaccination policy? If we do, what are our obligations? Uh, and what is the legal framework within which we, we do this? So when we were still in the state of disaster, uh, it was you know, um, justifiable to implement these mandatory vaccination policies because in terms of the regulations under the Disaster Management Act, um, there was a requirement that employers conduct a risk assessment. So the first step would be to look at the nature of your workplace and determine whether or not um, there was a need to implement such a, a policy. Uh, the state of disaster has now been ended in South Africa. And so the question that then arose is, well, can these policies still be justified as the regulations are no longer um, in force? Now, the pre prevailing legal position really is to look at the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, now, this act provides that employers are required to, um, to take appropriate or reasonable steps to ensure that the working environment is safe for em employees. And this includes looking at uh, biological hazards, illnesses, uh, and, the, and the like. Um, and I think the, 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 the position is that most of these mandatory vaccination policies, as they are called, um, are likely to be justifiable under the occupational health and safety. Uh, that's sort of rule of thumb. Um, but what is very important to, to look at is firstly, what is your workplace? Because not every workplace is going to, to need some form of a mandatory vaccination policy. Um, as Helen said, um, that in actual fact, a lot of these policies aren't so much mandatory vaccination policies, they are access policies. So when we talk about mandatory vaccination in South Africa and these sorts of policies, it's a bit of a misnomer because most of the policies are actually access policies. And what employers have been doing is they have been implementing policies that prevent access to employees who are not fully vaccinated. Um, the different policies or, you know, the question has arisen is what constitutes um, fully vaccinated? And there you would need to look at the nature of the workplace and the policy itself. Some policies are, if you've got your two shots, if it's the, the Pfizer or one shot, if it's Johnson & Johnson, then that will constitute um, uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, other policies require you to have the booster shots as and when they become necessary and available. Um, but the first thing that any employer is required to do or should do is do a risk assessment. So um, it's to look at the nature of your workplace, especially as more and more uh, employers are trying to get their workforces back uh, back into the, 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 the office. 
Um, so it's to look at your risk assessment. What is the nature of the business? What are the interactions between people? Um, are people in uh, open plan offices where they're more likely to be interacting in close proximity with each other? Um, and those are the sorts of things that um, we, we, are, we are looking at and advising on. Um, the other issue, though, to consider is your reasonable accommodation. Um, so it's to look at how can you accommodate employees who don't want to be uh, vaccinated. Um, I think similarly uh, in South Africa, there is a lot of skepticism about the, um, about the vaccinations. Um, there are you know, people who are objecting from constitutional positions, their rights to bodily integrity, uh, there are religious objections. Um, and, you know, it becomes quite a, 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 a minefield. Now, there have been an, a lot of, there has been a lot of pushback to these sorts of, um, of policies. And as a rule of thumb, our courts and the CCMA, which is the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, have been relatively unsympathetic to employees who refuse to vaccinate. Uh, and for the most part, um, there, there have been a number of applications to interdict the rollout of these sorts of policies. Uh, and I think in all of those cases that I, I am aware of that I've seen, the courts have actually found that uh, they, the, the applications stand to be dismissed because they're not urgent. Um, so that has been the one um, consideration. Um, and then there have been CCMA dismissal disputes where, or, or suspension disputes where employees have been either dismissed for not being vaccinated in breach of the policy, or they have been suspended um, and told they can't come into the office and they can't perform their functions or duties until they get paid. And on the whole, these policies have been upheld in the CCMA. We do not know um, where the Labour Court is going to go on that issue, but um, you know, at the, the position at the moment is, for the most part, these, these policies are being found to be justifiable. Um, now, the, there has been a question in the Q&A chat where um, I, uh, the, the, the question is, a mining client requires that all persons entering their premises must be vaccinated. Um, now, the client requires the employer in, in these circumstances uh, to have consultants who come and do surveys on the mine and and who come and work on the mine. So the question is, what happens if there is an employee of the um, service provider that is not vaccinated? Um, so the service provider's employee goes to the mine to conduct a survey or provide services. Um, and the mine says, you cannot access our premises. The question there is, what action can the service provider take? Can they discipline? and potentially dismiss the employee for the refusal to vaccinate. Now, as I was saying, there have been a number of these sorts of cases in the, that have been determined in the CCMA. Um, the, the cases that I have seen haven't been focused on disciplinary action. So dismissals because of some form of misconduct to refuse to get vaccinated. The majority of the cases have really been around the inability of the employee to perform his or her functions. So in this example, I would suggest that there is a capacity question because the employee cannot um, do his or her job because he can't access client's premises. So I think that there are steps that can be taken. Um, it would be looking at what is the reason for the employee's refusal. Uh, is the refusal a reasonable refusal? So. Uh, there are some employees who I believe have get, get medical advice saying you have some form of underlying health condition uh, and therefore you shouldn't um, get the vaccination. It would put you at risk. Is that the reason or is it just I refuse to be told what to do and I've got no in principle problem with taking the vaccine, but you're telling me to do it and I don't think you have the right to do it. So it's at least understanding what is the reason for the employee's refusal and then determining is it a form of misconduct or is it does it simply lead to an incapacity or an inability of the employee to form to perform his or her services and then once you determine that underlying reason 
then you can decide on the appropriate way forward. So can you reasonably accommodate the employee? Um, in the example of the, um, in, in the Q&A, um, will the client allow for PCR testing? So if, if that is the case, then that employee might have to go for a PCR test at their own cost uh, before going in, then they can perform their functions. Um, so it's just to get to the to, to grips with the specific facts of the case uh, to, to determine the way forward. But there have certainly been cases where dismissals for incapacity have been upheld by the CCMA. Um, but as I say, at this stage, those cases have not been tested on review in the labor court. So this position is still in flux. There is still a level of, of uncertainty. Um, so my advice to, to employers who find themselves in the situation is to, you know, do a thorough analysis of the employee circumstances, the company's requirements, so that you can justify any substantive reason or the substantive fairness of any dismissals. So that is just to deal with, um, with, with that question. Um, then moving on to the remote working. So as I said, I mean, there's quite a nice segue between the mandatory vaccination or access policies and remote work, because one of the ways of potentially reasonably accommodating employees is there may be certain employees in your organization who don't want to be uh, vaccinated, but who can actually perform their duties quite easily remotely. Um, there are also, as Helen said, uh, a number of businesses, or in fact, the majority, especially of sort of um, service providers, um, office-based um, employers who are moving towards a less traditional workplace. Um, I think as with some of the other jurisdictions, um, initially when, um, you know, a lot of the, the Gen Z and millennials ha um, have been pushing for more flexible work for remote work, and I think um, historically there was quite a lot of pushback from employers going, no, we need everyone in the office. With COVID, uh, that changed. It became much easier to, um, for, for employers to say, actually, you know what, this remote working does work. Employees are performing better sometimes. They are able to do their jobs. So it's to look at what should we, what, what should we be doing for our business? And that's obviously um, dependent on the nature of the business. You have manufacturers, factory workers, uh, farm workers, they will need to be physically present. Whereas your more office-based uh, workers, your um, professional service providers can very often perform their duties quite easily remotely. So it's assessing the nature of your business and what your needs are. But one of the considerations when doing that is attraction of talent and retention of talent. Um, in South Africa, and I think this is a common problem globally, is there has been a brain drain. A lot of employees who've gone through COVID and thought, you know what, this isn't what I want for my life, who are either changing careers or who are demanding more flexible work or demanding to work from different jurisdictions. So, you know, it's one of the things that employers are going to have to think about uh, very significantly is how do we attract and retain talent, especially when you've got the talent saying, I don't want to come in to the workplace nine to five, five days a week. Um, I want to work from home. A lot of um, employees are also saying, I want to work from overseas. So I still want to work for the company. I still want to work, you know, be a South African employee, but I want to perform my functions from the UK or from somewhere else in Africa. So those are a lot of the questions that we, um, we are facing from, from clients at the moment. Um, and the considerations there, for employees who are working in South Africa, it's slightly easier because you've got to look at what are your obligations to those employees. As an employer, you still have obligations in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act to ensure a safe working environment for employees. Now, one of the challenges we have is how do you control the remote work? How do you address safety of employees who are working from home? And those are instances where you need to be quite careful and you need to have an idea of 
of your workforce. So one of the some of the problems that we've been seeing is employees who are required to work remotely because of a decision by the employer, but they might not be their home environment might not be a safe working environment. They might be domestic violence. Um, there is a huge amount of gender based violence in South Africa, and it's the sort of things that you need to be looking at because when your employee is working when they are performing their functions in the remote workplace, are they being subjected to some form of domestic violence? And what are the employer's obligations and what are the employee's liabilities in those regards? So it's very important to be thinking about those sorts of considerations. There is also a new code of good practice on the a prevention and elimination of harassment in the workplace. Now this deals with discriminatory harassment, it's under the Employment Equity Act, and it sets out very specific requirements for employers to ensure a workplace that is free of discrimination, so or harassment based on a discriminatory ground. Um, so there are a lot of obligations that employers need to be aware of there. Unfortunately, I don't have time today to go into those, but just be aware of that. And then where you have this foreign, you know, workers who are working from outside the country, um, as with, um, you know, the, the other jurisdictions in Africa, the considerations are what are your tax obligations? So if I'm a South African based employee and I work for Bowman's, but I choose to work from, let's say, the, the, the United Kingdom, does that trigger some form of tax obligation in the United Kingdom or are the tax obligations still in South Africa? It's very important to take advice on those issues, to look at the specific circumstances. Uh, it's also important to determine what law applies. Uh, do I benefit from South African bank holidays, for example, or am I entitled to take bank holidays um, that are you know, set out in the, the UK? Um, and there, the policy and the framework of the policy is very important because you don't want employees almost getting um, the benefits of both. And they are effectively getting two types of, of bank holidays, two types of benefits. Um, so it's very important to be alive to those considerations and to take the appropriate advice when you're developing your policy or when you're allowing um, employees to have that flexibility. Uh, no, thank you. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, just no, am I out of time? Um, I uh, on the clock. Um, so there are certain issues that get that are flagged up, and I think we could do a whole seminar on those. Um, but I'm just going to um, pivot us just to round off with Mauritius. Um, Sinead, I know there is you've already got laws in place which anticipate flexible working. So if you yeah. wouldn't mind just um, taking us home on this, and then I'll do a very quick summation. Thank you. Right, thank you, Helen. Um, good morning or good afternoon to everyone, um, depending upon where we are, uh, where you are based. Um, as with other jurisdictions, Mauritius has also been affected with the pandemic, and it was important for the economy to continue running to what we would now say the new normal. Um, striking a balance between the health of the workforce and the economic normality um, has proven to be quite a challenge for the government, and one aspect of which was the issue of the mandatory vaccinations. Well, in Mauritius, vaccination is not mandatory for access at the workplace, except for certain prescribed specified institutions. Um, these specified institutions include educational institutions, health, um, residential care, airports and the harbour, beauty salons and the like. So in short, any place which the public has access to or um, any sector who is, who is dealing with uh, the more vulnerable section of the population, such as hospitals, residential care, well, their employees have a need to be vaccinated under law. Well, irrespective of the above, well, one section of the Motion Occupational Safety and Health Act requires employees um, to take reasonable care for their own safety and health while at work. Um, another section of the same act requires employers to, so as far as it's reasonably practical, um, to ensure the safety, health and welfare at work of all the employees. So what does this mean effectively? Um, for employers who do not fall within the prescribed specified institutions, 
um, it is at their discretion as to what vaccination policy they want to implement, while keeping in mind um, the legal requirements and also ensuring that the policy is not discriminatory in nature, um, as has been um, you know, discussed by uh, our other panelists. Um, although the choice to be vaccinated remains at the discretion of the employee, um, where an employer implements a vaccination policy, um, an employee who is absent from work or who is unable to access the workplace because he's not fully vaccinated or cannot produce a vaccination card or any other form of evidence that he's fully vaccinated, uh, the employee may agree for his absence from work to be deducted from any of his entitled leaves. Um, in the event that the employee refuses to be vaccinated, well, it is at the discretion of the um, respective employers to provide workplace access to the employee. Um, and we've seen in practice that this um, takes the forms of insisting um, on PCR tests from the employee each time they want to have access to the, um, to the workplace. Um, or agreeing on any hybrid working arrangements with that specific employee. Also, in a bid to encourage the workforce to be um, uh, vaccinated, an interesting fact is that the um, legislator has introduced a special type of leave, um, which is known as the COVID leave. What does this provide? It actually just allows an employee to absent himself from work on any day, um, for the purposes of vaccination, and he will be entitled to a leave with pay, provided that on resuming work, he produces vaccination card evidencing the vaccination. So he gets a special day um, or a special leave just to get vaccinated. So that's, I think that's a good move to encourage people to get vaccinated in Mauritius. Um, Talking now about um, the hybrid working arrangements that have been have evolved with this pandemic um, is the widespread acceptance of remote working and um, wherever it is possible. Yeah. So um, in Mauritius, keeping up with the demands of the industry, the, the legislator has introduced new concepts into the law. Um, one of which is a working from home and the, the working from home request can be made by either the employee or the employer. So um, if an employee makes a request to work from home and if the employer accepts that request, then the employee must inform the employer of where the work is going to be performed. So um, home, interestingly enough, home has been defined as any place of residence of the employee or any other place as may be agreed between the two parties. So you can agree with your employer whether you want to work um, anywhere else in the world, which is interesting. Um, it is also to be noted that the employer must also conduct a suitable and sufficient assessment at the proposed place of work to ensure that the performance of work um, does not entail any risk of, to the safety and health of the um, home worker and members of this of his family so obviously that's going like let's say um if somebody is going to agree to work in um uk it's going to um it's going to be interesting to see how they put the um obligation uh of the employee to ensure a safe environment in practice um so that's that's interesting um, also of note um is the introduction of flexi time um in the last two years in our laws um, again, this can be also at the request of the worker or the employer, um, but the employer can refuse a request from the employee um, to work, to go on a flexi time due to reasonable business grounds, um, which may include an inability to reorganize work or whether that would have a detrimental impact on the quality or performance of the employee. Um, so, like the legislator has um, provided for certain mechanisms already in the law um, to cater for the uh, for the new advents of of the working arrangements, right? Um, 
what has also what we have also seen in the last two years is the advent of the hybrid working arrangements right so where employees will be in the office for a couple of days and then would be working from home from the, for the rest of the week um, the hybrid working arrangement seems to be quite a favorite at the moment um, as it allows the employers to provide a safe working environment to the employees whilst maintaining social distancing measures without the need of obtaining any more office space, but it also allows the employ uh, employees to the flexibility of working from home while still maintaining physical contact with their colleagues and teams. Another, um, a further uh, consequence of, the, of this uh, working arrangement to, um, to what has already been discussed is uh, what we're seeing is the need for physical office space, right? Um, where employees and employers both are adopting the work, working from home situation, um, is there a need for a physical space for offices? Um, we have received a few requests from clients where they no longer found themselves in the need of the offices they were or are currently renting and are wishing to terminate these leases. Um, the fact remains, however, that they still need to keep a registered office address in Mauritius and alternatives are being looked at. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm just going to touch upon this quite quickly. Um, with, um, with the pandemic, um, taking the concept of working from home a bit further, one of the ideas introduced by the, Mauritius, uh, by the Mauritius government was the premium visa. Um, so what is the premium visa? It was introduced in 2020 and it allows foreign citizens to effectively reside in Mauritius along with the families for a renewable period of 12 months, right? So it's mainly aimed at tourists, uh, retired professionals wishing to come within, uh, with their families and carry out their activity um, from the islands. Um, just quickly on this one, um, in order to be, uh, to be eligible for the premium visa, um, an applicant must have proof of their long stay plans. Um, they need to show sufficient travel and health insurance for the initial period of stay. And most importantly, they should not seek employment in Mauritius, obviously. And the main place of uh, business and source of income should be from outside Mauritius. Obviously, there would be some tax considerations as well, depending on the length of stay um, of, uh, of the foreigners under the premium visa. But this will be on a case-to-case -case basis, right? Sorry, okay. Helen, I'm just, I just realized that I went a bit over time. No, thank you. And I'm sorry that we rushed you. So I, um, apologies, we've run slightly over. Just to do a very quick summation, um, thank you to everyone for joining. And if I could just summarize what I think the three trends of what we've taken out of this is our way of work has changed for good. We are not going back to five days in bricks and mortars um, in many instances, in many jurisdictions, and the law is reactive. Employers are leading the way. We are going to learn from our clients on this front, and it's going to be at a policy level rather than hardwiring it into employment contracts, ideally. Um, second point, the world is interconnected. What happens in Kenya has a ripple effect in other jurisdictions. And there's a lovely Tanzanian saying, which goes, many beads form one necklace. And I think as employers, we need to accept that how we string that together and how we wear that necklace, we can't just, just look at issues in our jurisdiction, even if our business is only in that jurisdiction. This world and this continent is truly interconnected. And final thing is, hopefully we're not having the vaccination debate next year, but what we have seen is employers are not sterilized from debates about employee rights, human rights. These have become front and center for employees. We just need to look across the ocean at the US with Roe versus Wade and the abortion rights debate. Employers are having to make a stand. Employees are expecting that. It's a very interesting space and we can't as employers and as law firms sit on the sidelines on these. Thank you for your time. I'm gonna end off there. And we really appreciate it. And there will be lots more on, on these things at a granular level that will be coming out from Bowman's and our partner firms that have joined us, our associate firms. Thanks all and have a good weekend.